Uh, well, good morning, Booker Tov. Uh, thank you, uh, General Yadlin. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Iran. Uh, and thanks uh, for the invitation to speak uh, at INSS, as I did four years ago uh, on uh, the day after our, our elections. Uh, I'm obviously following uh, an impressive uh, group, Ambassador Kurtzer, Professor Robinovich, uh, Ambassador Meridor, uh, uh, Rob Basson, uh, and I uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to do it. Uh, it's really, of course, been an extraordinary election and election campaign, and since, uh, as far as I know, unless it happened in the five or ten minutes uh, since I walked in from the car, uh, we still don't actually have uh, an outcome uh, declared for this election, so I obviously won't speak about outcomes. Um, but <clears throat> it has been striking to me how intensely followed this election has been by Israelis uh, as well as, of course, by Americans. And, of course, it's been one of the most intense and, uh, in some ways, difficult uh, campaigns that I can recall in American society. Uh, whatever the result and however one stacks up the, the numbers, uh, I think it is evidence uh, that there continue to be uh, some very, very uh, strong divisions, deep divisions within American society. Uh, and all of us as Americans have the responsibility as we uh, move forward with whatever our new uh, administration looks like to try to heal those divisions and, uh, and strengthen our country. But I have really been struck by the uh, intensity of the interest uh, that Israelis have uh, in, uh, in this election. And I guess that's for two reasons. One, because uh, Israelis, like many other countries, uh, uh, believe that American elections can affect them, uh, and that American leadership uh, affects uh, the United States, affects their security and their standing in the world. Uh, and so they, they take it seriously. But I think it also reflects how closely we identify with one another, how close our bilateral relationship is, uh, and, uh, and the, shared the shared democratic values we have uh, run very, very deep. Um, so uh, uh, I have, uh, I, 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 again, uh, since we don't have yet uh, even a president-elect declared, and I certainly, even if we did, wouldn't be uh, in a position to describe uh, what uh, the next administration is going to do, I think what it's uh, most useful for me to do is describe what the, I think the continuity uh, in the U.S.-Israel relationship is that the new administration will inherit. Um, obviously, it's been true for decades, and it's certainly been true uh, during President Obama's administration. Uh, that the United States has the deepest and strongest commitment to Israel's security uh, and to promoting the peace and stability uh, that we all want to see in this part of the world and whether it allow Israel to thrive and survive as a strong, secure Jewish democratic state at peace with its neighbors. Uh, and uh, I think that is uh, a continuity of American policy that has run through administrations of both parties uh, and uh, for many decades, and I believe uh, it's going to remain a central fa uh, feature of American foreign policy for many, many years to come. Um, uh, what the new administration will inherit, uh, uh, however, is uh, some very, very specific achievements uh, by uh, President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu together uh, in the security field where we have uh, dramatically uh, deepened uh, and upgraded our security partnership uh, in missile defense with the breakthroughs in Iron Dome and David Sling and Arrow 3, uh, now in tunnel detection technology uh, with the signing of our uh, new 10-year, $38 billion memorandum of understanding uh, and all the systems that will enable Israel to acquire, including F-35s, which are going to arrive uh, next month, uh, the first ones uh, as well. Uh, much deeper intelligence cooperation that uh, addresses all the th common threats we share, Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, Daesh, uh, all of the, the, the many uh, instabilities and, and terrorist and, uh, and weapon, uh, weapons, uh, 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 mass destruction threats that uh, exist in this region. Uh, now uh, even deeper in the field of cyber uh, as well. And so that's all on the table, uh, all uh, achievements of uh, the last uh, eight years. Uh, some of them predate that and have continued. Some of them have really only been uh, initiated during these last eight years, and the new administration uh, will uh, inherit uh, that and have a chance to build on it. The administration will also inherit a, an economic partnership that has uh, dramatically been upgraded uh, in, uh, in recent years as well. Much of that is led by our private sectors, particularly uh, in the high-tech industries, uh, where so many American companies have found success with research and development and 
product development and innovation uh, here in Israel, but increasingly Israeli companies are finding that America is a perfect market or platform uh, to take those technologies global uh, and get into the American market. And so we have really a, 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 a very vigorous uh, two-way economic partnership that is growing, uh, that has been undergirded by additional initiatives uh, to expand the dialogues between the economic policymakers in our government. Uh, and I believe there's great opportunity to build uh, on that uh, and grow, uh, grow as well. Uh, it's also true uh, that uh, the United States uh, and Israel uh, retain the close partnership and self-identification of two democracies, those shared values we always talk about. Uh, and any administration, as really it's more something that's foundational between our, our peoples, uh, will have that, uh, that commonality to build on uh, as well. Um, uh, so obviously, uh, uh, you know the uh, the the current Israeli uh, 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 security professionals and members of the prime minister's team and and and, and ministers in the government who we work with, uh, I think uh, will attest to the the work we the positive work we have done together. Uh, many of them will continue and be partners for uh, for the new administration uh, to work on, work with. Uh, and uh, and again, I think these are these are joint achievements, and they really stand the. Uh, the next administration in good stead uh, as they uh, as they get underway. Uh, now, uh, I mentioned uh, a little bit uh, earlier the uh, intensity and, in some ways, the difficulty because it was a very uh, uh, a very raw kind of presidential uh, campaign this year. It was really unlike uh, any other. Uh, it, it was very focused on the personalities uh, of the candidates, uh, their characters, uh, what people uh, thought they, about their views and what they said and, and how they acted. Uh, much less attention paid, in my judgment, to their policy proposals, uh, to the issues that will actually uh, be central to how, uh, how they will govern an administration. And so I think that's something that will take shape. Uh, as the president-elect uh, uh, comes off the campaign trail uh, and actually gets into the process of building an administration. Uh, the president-elect uh, will have to uh, immediately uh, sink his or her teeth into assembling a cabinet, a uh, national security council, uh, delving into briefings, including those that the outgoing administration uh, will provide, uh, thinking about how to work with the Congress uh, in order to achieve their plans. And I think it's it's something any new administration quickly has to learn, is that uh, campaigning is very different than governing. How one talks uh, during a campaign uh, often is about representing the hopes and dreams of, uh, of those who you're seeking to attract their support. Uh, maybe it's easier to describe uh, the choices between uh, uh, your candidacy and the others in very black and white terms. Um, uh, a president-elect will have to think uh, in a very different way about how to deliver uh, on, uh, on those promises, who they'll need to work with to get things done, what are the compromises of, uh, of governing, uh, who, the, who the relevant uh, uh, players are. Uh, I know that uh, uh, it's a, uh, uh, a well-known saying uh, in this part of the world, uh, uh, and I think uh, that's uh, true probably for any uh, political leader uh, coming off of a political campaign uh, or coming out of the opposition benches or coming out of uh, any non-governing role. Uh, the moment you step into that role with that responsibility uh, and the levers and tools one has, but also the limitations uh, that come with those tools, uh, the moment some of the choices start to look, uh, look different uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the politics uh, of a campaign uh, which may be uh, describing everything being possible uh, become the politics of what is the art of the possible uh, of, actually, uh, of actually governing. Uh, so I really won't uh, uh, speculate uh, on policies uh, by, uh, by the President-elect or, or by our new administration. Um, I, I will leave that to, uh, to others. Uh, and I won't uh, engage today in uh, deep analysis about the outcome, especially since the outcome has not yet been, uh, been firmly established. Um, but obviously, coming off a very divided, uh, a very divisive campaign and in uh, a situation where the numbers will clearly bear out that we have these deep divisions in our uh, country, uh, I think it is going to be an important question for how uh, uh, the two parties and how the leaders uh, who, uh, who take office uh, will work to uh, overcome those lingering tensions and, uh, and find some sort of commonality of a path forward. 
Uh, after all, uh, uh, there are Democrats and there are Republicans, but we are all Americans. Uh, we all love our country. We all want what's best for our country. There can be different views about what that is, uh, but there is something uh, very foundational uh, about uh, at least establishing that, uh, uh, that, common, uh, uh, that common priority. Um, uh, a new president, as I said, will also uh, have to take the lay of the land of Washington, of the Congress, of what the congressional uh, majorities and leaderships and, uh, and, and committee chairs uh, look like, uh, what their agendas are, uh, because no administration can uh, enact an agenda without uh, uh, working with the Congress. Uh, and even sometimes within the same party, there can be very different uh, agendas about how to proceed. Uh, and so uh, that's, going to be, uh, uh, that's going to be a major undertaking. Uh, cabinet appointments I mentioned, but uh, fully filling out an entire administration uh, is a, is a, is a months-long task. Uh, the sub-cabinet uh, and even down to the undersecretary and assistant secretary uh, level appointments are uh, very important, very influential, uh, and uh, uh, can take quite a while uh, to, to complete. That often leaves an administration with less than the full uh, bench uh, or the full team on the field. Uh, during the during the first months and relying more on the uh, professional uh, uh, professional uh, civil servants uh, to help them uh, guide them through that period uh, but that'll be something else uh, to watch as well as that we have a uh, still a, a vacancy on our Supreme Court uh, that uh, uh, has been uh, vacant for nearly a year and uh, uh, will be uh, uh, I think a priority to be filled um, uh, in thinking about who to bring into that administration for those cabinet or sub-cabinet positions, uh, there's always the, the, the interesting uh, set of decisions that go with that. Uh, personal relationships with the president or the president's cabinet officers are important. Uh, a broad base of experience, some who have served in governments before, some who come from politics, maybe state politics or from Congress, some who come from the business world or from uh, the nonprofit world uh, there or civil society. Uh, those are many, there are many, many different ways of constructing that cabinet uh, and that team and drawing on the different experiences that are relevant uh, to, uh, uh, to the, um, uh, drawing on that, uh, the, uh, the, all those different experiences in, in governing. Uh, last but not least, I'll just say that uh, President Obama, uh, in all circumstances, remains the president uh, until January 20th uh, when the new president is inaugurated. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it's important that I take the opportunity to reassure Israelis that during that transition period, it's business as usual uh, in our alliance. Uh, we will have uh, throughout this period uh, many senior visits by senior defense and intelligence officials uh, continuing their professional exchanges with their Israeli counterparts uh, across many, many fields. And I know the traffic goes in both directions, and I fully expect we'll see Israeli delegations uh, in Washington during that field. Uh, it covers security, it covers regional affairs, it covers arms control, it covers economic policy, homeland security, health and social affairs. There's really no uh, field that uh, will not be covered in any two-month period of time in the U.S. as a relationship, and that is also true when uh, we, are, we are in a transition. We will very much want uh, a new administration to hit the ground running uh, on, on all the aspects of the bilateral relationship that, uh, that I referenced. Uh, and we'll have one very, very, uh, I think, uh, uh, rich opportunity to celebrate a milestone in that relationship, but, but also something that, that, re that represents the future uh, and the opportunity to build. And that is that on December 12th, the first two F-35 uh, Joint Strike Fighter aircraft will, ar will arrive here in Israel at Nevatim Air Force Base. That is the beginning of uh, the next generation and the backbone of the Israeli Air Force for the next generation. <laughs> Uh, and I believe it will be a, uh, a very important uh, moment, both of symbolism and substance, uh, in terms of a partnership that uh, has achieved a great, great deal, as I mentioned, until this moment, and has many, many opportunities to achieve even more uh, in the years ahead. So with that, I think I uh, will... Question? Yes, I will take one question from you, Odid. Okay. Uh, many thanks, to Dan, for coming this morning. A um, couple of issues came up in the earlier briefings this morning. One has to do with the possibility of the current administration going to the or supporting a resolution in the Security Council. Uh, how do you uh, deal with it in the context of the elections? Yeah. And yeah. the other one uh, came up and that is the JCPOA uh, that because the president elect, if he is president-elect, said in the debates 
that he is absolutely against the, the deal with Iran, and together with the majority retained by the Republicans in the Senate, uh, there will be an attempt by the U.S. to reopen. How do you, uh, if you can, care to uh, uh, say uh, uh, what's your view on these two issues? Sure. And the last one, sort of a funny one. Are you the last ambassador, uh, U.S. ambassador, to work from Tel Aviv? Great. <laughs> three, three easy ones. Three easy ones. Uh, on the issue of the Security Council or any uh, action the Obama administration might consider uh, related to the Palestinian issues, um, uh, there's really nothing I can add to what I've said previously on this, which is that there's no decision and there's no uh, uh, particular direction for a decision and there's no timetable for a decision. Uh, what there is is a, a deep concern, uh, as has been expressed by not just the United States, but by the, all the members of the Quartet. Uh, in the Quartet Report uh, published last summer, uh, that uh, the two-state solution uh, is receding uh, from us, uh, that conditions on the ground, a combination of violence and incitement and governance challenges on the Palestinian side and settlement expansion and demolitions of Palestinian homes and constriction on Palestinian economic development in Area C from the Israeli side. Hamas has, of course, continued terror uh, reign in Gaza. Uh, of all posed challenges that are making the two-state solution, which remains the goal of the United States, it remains the goal of the Prime Minister, uh, uh, more difficult with each passing day. Uh, and we're quite worried about that. Uh, the Quartet Report identifies a number of steps on the ground that we believe the parties can take addressing those uh, challenges I mentioned uh, in the hopes of trying to steer uh, us so back onto the path of a uh, resumed negotiation eventually. It wouldn't happen in the near term, I don't think. Uh, but uh, uh, arresting those trends that are really taking us into a place where we think the, the two-state solution may become near impossible achieve, to achieve and we may be faced with a binational reality, the very thing we and the Prime Minister and Palestinians all say uh, they do not want. Um, so that's uh, what the Quartet Report uh, provides. Uh, by the same token, uh, the, Prime, the President uh, uh, asks himself and asks us as an administration uh, if there are any steps that we might take in the remaining time that he has in office that would also help arrest those trends uh, that take us in the direction of a binational reality and put us back on the path of a uh, negotiated two-state solution. Uh, making that at least an achievable, viable objective for the next administration and, and its partners here to work on together. Um, and uh, there's, so there's any number of range of options that have been proposed, and you mentioned one, but uh, I can name ten others, uh, and there are uh, advocates for and detractors for, against uh, all such proposals. Uh, I, it would be impossible for me to speculate on any particular decision, uh, certainly based on something that hasn't been drafted or proposed yet. Uh, but I can say that the motivation of any initiative that the President would consider during this period is exactly what I said. How do we help arrest the trends that are taking us away from a two-states-for-two-people solution and toward a binational reality and put the two-state solution back on the path of viability uh, for the future? Uh, so that's the motivation behind even, the, even considering the question. Uh, in terms of the JCPOA, I certainly will not speculate on uh, uh, the next administration's propose, uh, 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 approach to it. Uh, what I will say uh, is that we continue to believe, uh, and I think the evidence bears this out, uh, that the JCPOA has been uh, very successful in doing exactly what it was designed to do, uh, that is to block systematically each pathway Iran had to achieve a nuclear weapon, uranium enrichment, plutonium, covert means, uh, by, putting, by removing the, the materials from enriched uranium to, uh, to centrifuges to uh, blocking up the plutonium facility. Uh, and putting in place uh, the most intrusive monitoring and inspection regime that, that we've ever seen, such that there's no chance that Iran, during the term of this agreement, is going to be able to break out, and it will, they will remain at at least one year uh, distance from a breakout. This is a far more advantageous situation than we were in before the JCPOA. There's no disagreement, by the way, between the United States and Israeli experts uh, about Iran's adherence uh, to the terms of that agreement. Uh, and so uh, we believe strongly and obviously will recommend to, uh, to the next administration that uh, uh, this agreement uh, uh, should continue because it, it, it does fulfill that, uh, 
uh, that function. Uh, but uh, you know what uh, what uh, what the next group of uh, uh, American policymakers will decide in consultation with uh, Israeli and uh, P5 plus one and Arab and other partners. Uh, I, I I will not I will not speculate on. Uh, and as for the embassy, uh, I go to work uh, where uh, our embassy is, and uh, uh, that's been the uh, uh, decision uh, of every president that has looked at this issue uh, over many decades. Uh, again, uh, there's no point in my speculating on, uh, on the future. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And I forgot to uh, congratulate you upon the Cubs Thank you. victory. Thank you. Uh, Dan comes from Chicago.